Let me know, Doc, if ipiplay ko na po yung video. Uh, let's wait about five minutes, usually. Nagdadatingan na. Mga 8.35, let's do it.
Ready na, Feb? Okay po. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, um, good morning everyone in the Philippines and uh, good evening to those here in the United States. I'm Marge Pena, uh, the Vice President for PASE and our president sends her apologies for not being here because they are caught in uh, the typhoon, uh, was it Christine? And they don't have power and internet. So um, hopefully those, we had a lot of people sign up for this webinar and hopefully they can make it, but if not, as always, these are all recorded. And also for those who can uh, follow this on Facebook, we are also live on Facebook. So anyway, welcome everyone to our um, our um, Paase webinar series. Uh, this month, since it's the, uh, in the month of October, it's the Filipino American History Month celebration. And so we have highlighted this by presenting a series of three seminars. So last week we had a seminar on um, the use of um, uh, tissue on the chip. Uh, and so uh, it was well attended and uh, new technology that is being funded in the Philippines. And today is the second in the series, uh, which, which will be presented by Dr. Uh, Zinia Agustin, who I will introduce in a little bit. And Monday, weather permitting, uh, we have the third in the series, which will be presented by Dr. Advincula, Rigoberto Advincula, who is familiar to many Paasi members. It will be an in-person seminar in UPLB, and hopefully um, the technologies, and they will be up and running there with electricity to be able to present that seminar. Uh, that will also have an online component um, uh, uh, as well for those who are not able to attend it in person. Okay, so welcome to our series. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce our past president, immediate past president and ex officio member of the board, Dr. Mario Santo Domingo, who will give us an introduction about uh, the celebration, the history of the celebration of the Philippine American History Month in October. Mario? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vice President Marge Pena. Let me just uh, start, you know, 
sharing my uh, slides and uh, we'll be starting very soon. So uh, this uh, month is the Filipino American uh, History uh, uh, Month and it's celebrated every October, uh, recognizing, you know, the uh, contributions of the Filipino and Filipino Americans in the United States. Right now, there's uh, over 4 million Filipinos living in the United States today, according to the 2020 census, uh, majority of whom, or most of whom, you know, are uh, in uh, 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 California, Hawaii, New York, you know, and uh, some other uh, larger states. So uh, the Filipino American History Month, uh, uh, as I've said, honors the contributions of Filipino Americans to U.S. history, uh, culture, and society. But it also uh, uh, actually looks back into uh, when the first uh, Filipinos arrived in the United States, and that was in 1587. It wasn't the United States yet, as we know it uh, today. You know, in Morro Bay, California, uh, called the Luzones in Indios, there were the Filipino sailors who arrived on the Spanish galleon, Nuestra Señora de Esperanza. So it was the part of the Manila galleon trade, which was a global network that connected uh, Europe, Asia, and the Americas from 1565 to 1815. Uh, the uh, celebration also recognizes the significant waves of migration of Filipinos uh, uh, to uh, this uh, continent, including Filipino laborers in Hawaii and California in the early 20th century, and the impact of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. So with that particular act, you know, there was the abolition of the quotas, uh, uh, but kept the immigration from the Western uh, world. I also established a preference system that favored immigrants from uh, with skills or family ties to U.S. citizens or refugee status and opened the door to non-European immigration, uh, including, of course, uh, those from Asia. Uh, the, uh, of course, the uh, these contributions uh, uh, span a broad spectrum, you know, of areas. Including healthcare, we know that you know uh, uh, many many uh, uh, healthcare workers, you know, including the nurses, are uh, serving here in 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 the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, during uh, uh, COVID, uh, a large uh, number of Filipino nurses were you know uh, 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 victims, you know, of, of COVID. But the most important uh, area that we are of course concerned uh, today is of course, science and engineering, because, uh, you know, PAASE being an organization of scientists and engineers. Uh, so PAASE was uh, founded in 1980, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering uh, at Purdue University uh, uh, to promote scientific collaboration between the U.S. and the Philippines. So it seeks to uh, it, uh, bridge the gap between Filipino and American scientists fostering innovation, and enhancing the global Filipino community's contribution to science and te technology. The uh, uh, PASE was uh, founded by Dr. Severino Ko, the founding president, uh, and it had it, its first conference at Silais Hotel in Manila uh, uh, in the Philippines uh, on January 6 to 8, 1981. So it has had a long history and has had an impact, you know, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, practice of science, uh, here in the U.S. and, of course, in the Philippines, because we've uh, been investing a lot uh, in terms of uh, building, you know, the uh, human infrastructure in science, you know, uh, in many places, uh, of course, particularly the Philippines. One of the investments we have is, of course, the uh, uh, publication uh, of, of the official journal of Paase, which we call the Science J Science or formerly the Philippine uh, Science Letters. Now we call it the Sciang J. And we are open to, of course, submissions from you uh, in uh, many, many areas of uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics and medicine. You know? uh, uh, please visit uh, our uh, website, uh, sciang.org, to learn more about uh, 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 this uh, publication. 
So uh, in closing, I'd like to uh, again invite everyone to celebrate with us, you know, the Philippine American History Month, uh, which uh, serves as a bridge between the Philippines and the Filipino diaspora, celebrating shared history and achievements. Uh, uh, let's explore together the Filipino American history and engage with the global Filipino community through events and collaboration. We understand that many of our Kababayans are uh, uh, experiencing difficulties right now because of uh, uh, Typhoon Christine. So we wish everyone well, and uh, we hope that uh, this uh, particular uh, session will still be watched by many of our colleagues uh, in in uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, and that uh, we continue to uh, be uh, 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 caring, you know, about uh, each other, and of course to still be uh, 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 interested in uh, science and technology uh, despite uh, you know uh, the experiences we are uh, uh, actually undergoing uh, right now so maraming maraming salamat po and I'll give back the uh, uh, virtual floor to uh, Dr. Peña thank you thank you Mario thank you so much for giving us a background on the Filipino American History Month uh, all over the United States um, there's a lot of celebrations uh, in honor of uh, the arrival of the Filipinos and the contributions that they make throughout the, uh, uh, it, not just in science and um, engineering, which is a focus of our organization, but also in many different aspects, uh, particularly in healthcare, in the arts and in and, and society. And so uh, again, as I as Mario was saying, we all um, are praying for all our compatriots in the Philippines who are now uh, being afflicted by uh, Typhoon Christine. And so we thank those of you who are able to make it to this webinar in spite of the brownouts and uh, the Baha that we're seeing so many pictures of. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to participate in this um, webinar and hopefully that uh, you will learn something from it um, and uh, uh, we'll be able to share some of the things that we, that doc, the Dr. Uh, Augustine uh, will talk about today. And so as Mario has said, um, even though we are separated by a big ocean, the Pacific Ocean between the United States and the Philippines, uh, a lot of us go back to the Philippines to contribute. And uh, just to mention the CIANJ, we had a lot of right shops during the PAASE, the APAMS meeting last summer uh, to help many of the Filipinos learn how to publish their scientific work because that is the currency of our science. So anyway, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Maria Zinia Agustin. Zinia is not a stranger to me and Edsel. We have known her from the moment she set foot in the United States. Um, so Zinia is currently um, a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, where she currently serves as the Actuarial Science Program Director and undergraduate program director. So she actually reports directly as uh, to the provost of uh, SIU as part of her duties in this particular program. So outside of the mathematics and statistics department, she is coordinator for curriculum development in the office of the provost, as I mentioned, and the director for integrative studies program. Xenia obtained her Bachelor of Science in Statistics and MS in Mathematics with concentration in actuarial science at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. So after te uh, teaching at UP Diliman for two years and working with the actuarial group at CSIP Gores and Belayo and company for three years, she decided to continue her academic adventure at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. And that is where our paths intersect because uh, Edsel Pena, who is my husband, as you know, was one of her professors at Bowling Green State University. So at BJSU, she completed her master's in applied statistics degree, as well as her PhD in mathematics with concentration in statistics under the direction of Edsel Pena. So her current research interests are reliability, survival analysis, and student success. And so the program that she's going to, uh, the, the title of her talk today uh, has to do with ensuring success of students in the engineering programs. And it is Enrichment Sessions in Calculus One, A Path to Retaining and Graduating Engineering Majors. So Xenia, um, welcome to Paase and take it away. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you everyone. So as Marge said, 
Our hearts are with the Filipinos right now in the midst of this storm. So thank you, Marge, for the invitation to present tonight. So this work is a collaboration with Marcus Agustin, who's my personal and professional collaborator, and George Pelicanos, who's the chair of the math department here at um, Southern Illinois University, Department of Math and Statistics. So this program came about as a collaboration with the School of Engineering and the Department of Math and Statistics. So in the United States, it has been documented that less than 40% of students who start as STEM majors graduate with a STEM degree. Now, if you read, and I know Edsel posted something lately, when you look at which majors are the best majors, they're all in STEM. So they're mostly engineering, then you have the mathematics in there. So if less than 40% who start as STEM majors graduate with a STEM degree, and there is, um, growth in the job market, then this would impact us because we will not be able to fill the need of the job market. So what is causing STEM majors to get out of the STEM area? Well, unfortunately, it's math that serves as a barrier for them. So performance in early mathematics courses is one of the things that has been written in the literature as the main source of people getting out of STEM. And for engineering majors, unfortunately, it's not just one semester of calculus, but it's, whoops, did I forget to share my screen? Yeah, you had to share your screen. <laughs> oh my <Sorry>. gosh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, so for um, engineering majors, they need a three semester sequence. So that's a typical calculus sequence. So if they can't even complete the very first one, which is your calculus one, then it's really a barrier for persistence in the major. So this is a problem that's known throughout. So universities have tried implementing various approaches to support students. And for STEM courses, particularly math, chemistry, and biology, two widely used approaches are the supplemental instruction and the peer-led team learning. So let me just describe them. So the SI approach focuses on at-risk classes, not on at-risk students. So they look at the class as a whole, and what they define as at-risk classes would be those classes where the passing rate would be very low. So these are typically entry-level courses. So undergraduate students who performed well on the course are recruited and trained to be SI leaders. So the setup is that the SI leaders will attend the class lectures, and they are the ones who independently choose the problems for students to work on during SI sessions. Now, this SI are voluntary. So the sessions are voluntary because their schedules are based on the availability of the leader and the students. Now, on the other hand, for the peer-led team learning, they use small groups. They still also use trained undergraduate peer leaders, but the framework that they have is that each group will have a problem. So typically it's just one or two problems per session because they encourage discussion. So they question, they analyze, and then they deliberate to come up with an answer or a solution to the problem. So the group members collectively develop knowledge and mastery of class material. But again, student attendance may be voluntary and the work during the session can be graded or it can just be a pass fail. So it's just, did you complete it or not? So what we tried to do is, well, we decided to take the best aspects of the SI and the PLTL models, and we implemented what we call as enrichment sessions in Calculus One. So what are we interested in? We want to retain the engineering majors. We want them to be able to succeed in their calculus sequence. And for a lot of universities, you, you want to look at the graduation rates. You want your students to graduate within a reasonable amount of time. So this study was supported by an NSF grant 
that we um, obtained with the School of Engineering. So what are enrichment sessions and who are the personnel involved? So aside from the students, we have the enrichment session leaders, we have the faculty coordinator of the ES leaders, and right now it's Marcus Agustin who is um, the faculty coordinator. We have another faculty writing the worksheets, and then we have the class instructors who are actually in the trenches. So communication among all of these personnel is crucial because we always have a loop that goes in to inform what would be in the worksheets. So what happens in an enrichment session? Remember, we took the best uh, aspects of the SI and the PLTL. So we have small groups of students engaged to solve problems collaboratively. So when we say small groups, that means four or five students. So every session, they will have a worksheet. And what we encourage is not just to work on those alone and try to finish as early as possible, but we encourage discussion among group members. And so it's actually nice to see sometimes whenever the, um, the discussions are very lively among the group members. So who leads the discussion or who facilitates the discussion? These are again, undergraduate peers, and we take them from engineering and other STEM majors. So you might be wondering, so what are in this worksheet problems? So they cover current course material, but also previous skills or concepts that students have struggled with. So we try and um, put those concepts over and over again in different settings so students know the importance of those foundational skills. Now, while we encourage discussion and deliberation, at the end of the enrichment session, each student submits their individual work, and these are graded by the ES leader. Now, we all know what human nature is. We want to always be comfortable with the people that we're working in. So every week, students are assigned to different groups. So we tell the ES leaders, okay, you have to watch out. Um, we don't want all the good ones to be in one group we want to distribute them so that the students being engineering majors, later on, they'll be working in groups and they cannot choose who their teammates would be. So attendance at enrichment sessions is required. It actually is in their course schedule and the worksheet grades count as part of the course requirements. So who are these peer leaders? So we recruit them from students recommended by previous instructors and previous ES leaders. And it, the recommendation is based on academic performance and interpersonal skills. So it's not just enough that you're good in calculus. You have to be able to communicate and explain things. Especially, you also have to have patience because you're not going to explain it to people who already know it. There will be a lot of questions that will come up. And we all, we take those ES leaders from a pool where, who have completed at least calculus two and have performed well. And if in the ideal scenario, we want them to have a grade of A. Now this ES leaders go through an interview process. So we ask them to present a concept in calculus and typically it will be the very first um, concept on derivatives. They have to explain it to a panel of faculty members and the faculty members simulate the freshman classroom. We try to ask questions that the typical student would be asking. So they should be able to explain it. Now, once they're chosen, then the faculty coordinator trains them because what their main, our main goal is not for them to tell the students what to do, but to facilitate the discussion. So we train them to pose questions, okay? So the questions have to stimulate the discussion or to lead to the students to be thinking about, well, how could I solve this problem?
Now, what goes into the worksheet? So we have a separate faculty who develops these worksheets. And this faculty is not teaching Calculus 1. So what we don't want to do is for the instructors who are teaching to have a vested interest in their students coming up to be to have higher grades. So we want this to be independent. So the worksheet problems are developed by, right now, it's the chair of the department. Now, the worksheets consist of conceptual and computational problems. So our goal with this is to deepen the student's understanding. So it's not the rote um, plug and chug type of questions. There will be skills involved, but we want to deepen their understanding of calculus because we want them to be able to see that when they get to their upper level engineering classes, calculus is still um, at the base of all those problems. So as I mentioned earlier, problems are based on current course material. And so how do we make sure that they're based on current course material? So by Wednesday of each week, the instructors will have to inform the faculty developing the worksheets where they expect to be the following week. So that information is taken into account in developing the next week's um, worksheet problems. So why, are, why did we decide to use this ES model? Because we want, what we have seen is that students can do the plug and chug, but if you ask them to explain why they're doing what they're doing, it just comes down to, it's the formula. And so we want them to be able to explain, okay, where did that formula come from? That didn't just fall from heaven. So we want them to learn how to communicate mathematical ideas and work in a problem solving team. And it's so heartwarming whenever you watch the discussions and you see when the light bulb comes on and the students actually take pride in owning the idea. So the other thing that works well with the ES model is that when they interact with their peers, both the ES leaders and the fellow students, they break down the abstract ideas. And then that reinforces their communication and mathematical skills. We actually piloted this ES approach and it showed Promise. So Marcus actually was the one who graciously allowed us to use his class as a guinea pig, uh, as a guinea pig, and then um, the results for the ES approach. And actually, that pilot was the one that was instrumental for us getting the NSF grant. So what's the study? The only focus with the School of Engineering, and we look at five consecutive fall semesters. So why fall semesters? Because our population of students in Calculus One in the fall semester is significantly different than the ones that take Calculus One in the spring semester. So fall semesters are typically our incoming freshman students, while spring semester would be those who have failed Calculus One in the fall or who needed to take the prerequisite courses before they can take Calculus One. So in this study, we're looking at 989 engineering majors. So a typical enrollment in a Calculus One class is 50 to 60 students. And who are required to take Calc One? All the STEM um, majors. And then we have the occasional business majors. So they need to have pre-calc. So they need to have the algebra plus the trig in order to be able to get into Calc 1 or a satisfactory placement score. So our Calculus 1 setup, all students had 80 minute lectures with their instructors, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then they took either a Calc 1 with the required enrichment sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or the other option is the section that has a computer lab or a recitation session once a week. So the computer lab uses Mathematica while the recitation session uses um, problem session with um, problems developed by the instructor of the course. So students with a ES met at the same scheduled time as the lecture 
while the ones in the computer lab or recitation session, because we have 50 to 60, they were divided into three smaller sections. The other difference is that the enrichment sessions were led by undergraduate students, so they are their peers, while the computer lab or recitation sessions were supervised by the graduate TAs. So what are our variables of interest? Did the student pass calculus one with a grade of C or better? So in the Philippines, did they get one, two, or three? Retention, retention rates are closely watched in university. So we wanted to look at the retention in engineering because of um, the attrition in the STEM majors. And then we also looked at graduation rate. Now, towards the end of the study period, the department instituted a common final exam score. So we'll look at that for a little bit after, um, towards the end of this. So as I've mentioned earlier, we have 989 declared engineering majors and 479 of them opted to be in the ES sections. So we normally offer seven sections of calculus one in, a semester, in the fall semester, and two of them are ES sections. And lo and behold, so these are not stellar numbers, but they're typical um, passing rates for calculus one. So for those who had ES, a little bit over two thirds passed calculus one with a C or better, while those in the non-ES, only half of them passed um, calculus one with a C or better. Now you need a C or better in order to proceed to calculus two. So this was a result that made a, a school of engineering dean happy because he, they were able to have more students progress into calculus two. So when we looked at retention and graduation rates, since we have to follow the students until graduation, we're only looking at the first two cohorts so we can follow them for the four and five year graduation rate. The total number of students in the first cohort is 119.68 of whom were in ES sections. So if we look at the retention for the next year, so when we say retained, so that means the students who were engineering majors this fall are still engineering majors in the next fall, and they're still with the university. So if they didn't do the ES, 74, roughly 75% retained as an engineering major. But if they did the ES, 85% of them were retained as an engineering major. So again, we're seeing the difference. And in the university, with all the budget issues that we're having, we always hear that every student that we retain is worth $10,000. So we're doing everything that we can to retain the students that show promise. Uh, so when we look now at the four-year graduation rate, now I know you might be gasping and said, whoa, that's so low. Okay, so Engineering majors typically do not graduate in four years. So if we look at their um, graduation rate in four years, again, there is a difference from 23% to 32%. Now, Edsel is here, so I will let you decide what your level of significance is. I'm just giving the p-value. So you can decide whether that is a significant difference to you or not. But when you look at the five-year graduation rate, which is the typical amount of time that it takes for our engineering majors to graduate, we go from a 50% to a 62% graduation rate. Okay. Now, in six years, we were only able to follow the first cohort, and we had Again, a difference in their proportion of graduation. So when we look at this data and when we present it 
to administrators in the university, they will always ask, so can we scale this up? Well, we will say, well, it, we can scale it up with university support. Now, in the last two years of the study period, the department implemented the common final exam. So this, the common final exam is written by the undergraduate program director and reviewed by the undergraduate program committee. So again, in ensuring the independence, the committee members who are teaching Calculus One do not participate in the review. So they do not have um, undue advantage over the other instructors. Now, our department policy sets certain parameters for the common final exam. So there are certain elements that have to be in the common final exam in terms of the topics. And the thing also is that it has to count for at least 25% of the grade. So for this one, the data that we used would be for all students who took the final exam in Calculus One during those last two years of study. We could then, uh, there is no distinction between engineering students and non-engineering students. But it also showed promise because when we look at the ES, so this now is the mean of their final exam score. Again, they're not stellar numbers, but we all know that whenever you have a common final exam and it's comprehensive, students tend to score lower. The typical student tends to score lower. So we're seeing here again that the mean, now remember there are always outliers in these groups. So the 43% versus a 68%. And that big difference is the one that um, divides the students who are the ones who would get a D or lower and those who would get a C or higher. So when we, so in order for you to have time for questions, so what would be my concluding remarks? This enrichment sessions, they're showing promise. So we applied for a grant through the university and they gave us support. The department is currently using enrichment sessions in all calculus one sections. Now, we have to look at it and we'll see that this is such a big ask and it's labor intensive, but we're trying to investigate the effectiveness of the scaling up because now we want it for all students in Calculus One, not necessarily just the engineering majors. And um, the initial data is also showing promise, although with the COVID, effect, there is confounding happening because now, instead of us concentrating on really deepening their understanding of calculus, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that there's also a huge learning loss. So we also have to put in some remediation within this worksheet sessions. So we're hopeful that the success that we had for the engineering majors will follow through when we are, now that we're scaling it up for all students in Calculus One. Okay. So that is it. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be open to questions, comments, Thank you, Xenia. That's a very, very interesting study and a lot of work since so many people take calculus, <laughs> not just, um, I know biology majors are supposed to take calculus too, which they dread. Okay, uh, so um, um, uh, the floor is open for questions now. Does anybody, if anybody wants to ask any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, signify that you wanna ask a question. How do you raise your hand? Uh, there's a, um, where is it? <laughs> you can just speak it, so go for it. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Sinha. This is very important, I think. Uh, in the, in here at the University of South Carolina, uh, 
the provost, I think, in her report said that uh, we are now at 92% retention. That's a uh, oh, Presma, Presma uh, to second year. And so we are trying to make it to 94% retention. Uh, that 2% could be a little bit difficult to achieve. But uh, uh, one of the courses, of course, that is a stumbling block are the mathematics courses aside from the chemistry courses. So this is very important. Uh, now, uh, first uh, question, uh, have you all published the results of this? Because uh, other universities might actually be interested in implementing this uh, uh, system. Okay, so the pilot study we have published, this one is in the process of being written and being mm -hmm. submitted for publication. Yeah. yeah, I think it's good. It's good to, to have it published because I think uh, many universities will be very interested in that increasing the retention. My second question is more uh, about the, the baseline of the students in the two groups. Uh, did, you, did you randomize the students into the different sections? No, or because we, we can't. Uh, yeah, they enrolled on their own. Yeah. Now, if, uh, the, did you keep track of, uh, say, the SAT or the or the ACT scores, or at least the math scores, to to uh, use it potentially as a coup barrier to adjust for differences. Yes. So actually, I didn't present it here, but we also looked at the ACT scores of the uh -huh. students, and then I actually did a logistic regression, and okay. so the ACT and the ES having ES is are the factors that could. Uh, predict their success in Calculus mm -hmm. 1. Now, the problem right now is that the university stopped requiring those standardized tests. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and we all know that high school GPA is not at all <laughs> an indicator because <laughs> there are different levels. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Another thing that the administrators are always saying is, can you look at so, uh, social economic? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because because those could be confounding. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Billy, Billy has a question. Billy knows how to raise his yeah, hand. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, ma'am. First of all. I'm almost afraid to ask this question. You know, why would a doctor be asking a, a statistical uh, a question? <laughs> uh, I did get a 1.0 in uh, calculus in pre-med, <laughs> but I, I was able to compute, but I, I, I hardly knew what was it was for. I'll just start <laughs> with that. But I had the same concern as uh, Dr. Peña. Dr. Edsel Spanish question with regards to the randomization of uh, the students. So if you start a statistical problem and you're trying to compare whether one group is really better than the other and the parameter that uh, you are trying to isolate is the ES experience. So what if, uh, one side was actually intellectually more uh, powerful, to use a word, than, than the other. And uh, you know, they, they choose that class. So how then could you then conclude that ES will, um, will assure that there will be civil engineers like my brothers? <laughs> OK. Yeah. So. Um, related to Edsel's question, what we did was to look at their ACT scores when they were still um, available, and there was no significant difference between the ACT scores of those who chose the ES versus those who didn't choose the ES. And so um, I know that's a limitation of the study, but 
here in the States, you really can't randomize them because mm -hmm. the students will say, I have the freedom to choose whichever section I want to go into. And so <laughs> we will run into problems when we force them. And then if they end up not doing well, they'll come back and demand their money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's definitely a limitation of the study. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in, in your expansion effort for this, that, that entails a lot of work from student volunteers or students that are chosen to be the 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 tutors or whatever, yes. the leaders of the group, and then a lot of commitments from the faculty as well. So how does that um, affect <laughs> people who want to carry out the whole study of, uh, you know, teach calculus um, uh, in, in the department? Uh, are there people opting not to teach or teaching later? Um, so actually for the ES leaders, they're actually one of the highest paid student oh. workers in the university. So we pay okay. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, so this is like a, a, a job, a university job for them because they're expected to spend um nine hours per week uh -huh, uh -huh. on their duties. Now for the um, faculty who's doing the worksheet, that's a course release. Uh -huh. And then the faculty who's coordinating, that's also a course release. So that's why we had, I, we had to beg for money. And we told uh -huh. the, um, the university, if you want to see success, well, we have to invest. Mm -hmm. as it will not be for free yeah so it's it's also um when we started this the nsf gra uh, grant funded it then our chancellor our previous chancellor had what he called us an innovation grant and we applied for that and we got that and mm -hmm. it's still ongoing until now mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The other question I have is that uh, these are mostly focused for um, from uh, uh, for the engineering students. What about non-engineering students that so, to take these <laughs> calculus? <laughs> yeah, so and right. I'm very now, fond of it. Yeah, so right now um, it's available to all students. So all calculus one students now mm -hmm. avail of the enrichment sessions. So we didn't have a study on the non-engineering because this was a collaboration with the School of Engineering. Oh, so yeah. we tried to please them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, uh, um, I was sorry, I'm not sure if uh, anyone is in the Philippines uh, in the audience, but uh, is it the same problem that uh, we have here in the US about uh, uh, people, students having difficulty with mathematics, uh, and is it the same case in the Philippines? How is that? Maybe there is nobody from the Philippines. Uh, no, there, to... there are a lot from the Philippines. So, um, anyone in our audience can answer that question in the engineering field. Don't be shy. <laughs> There's a question from Jojo Blanza on the chat box. How about the ES student leaders? What do they get in return? Do they get additional grades? Or do they just get paid? <laughs> yeah, so the ES leaders actually get paid. And according to them, the big thing that they're getting is that they're improving their confidence and then they're also improving their communication skills. So when they go for interviews, for internships, mm -hmm. they have the confidence to speak to anybody. And the mm -hmm. other thing too that they're saying is that when they get to their upper level engineering classes, because they have such a solid grasp of their calculus, that it helps them because so the other students have forgotten what they learned in calculus their junior year, but since they're immersed in it, then it comes naturally to them. I guess they have to really learn it. It's like teaching a, teaching any kind of course. You really have to learn it before you can actually convey it to the students. So they're already ahead in terms of that. 
Right. And that's what happens whenever they meet weekly with the faculty coordinator. So basically what they do is they preview the next week's um, problems and then they try to anticipate. So what would be a common mistake here? What would be the students thinking about when they see this problem? So they try to role play in order to be ready. And the other thing too is that they have to provide their solutions to the worksheet problems. So they get the worksheets by Thursday, they provide a solution to the faculty by Sunday. The faculty gives them feedback to be ready for Tuesday. Ooh. Yeah. So they're like taking the course again all over, huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and the worksheets change every semester. So even if this is your second semester as an ES leader, it doesn't mean that you can just go through your notes from the last time. <laughs> so they'll probably be in demand <laughs> as they go into their careers because they're experts on this field. Yeah. Okay. So the no. only problem is that we they're usually also the uh, student leaders in other organizations. So that's why we have to make sure that we interview early and we pay more than the other jobs oh. on campus. <laughs> okay. Now, okay. Well, one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sure it's also the same in uh, SIUE and other universities here, is uh, a lot of the American students are kind of scared of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know where they start getting scared of math. Uh, it's a difficult subject. We all know that math is not an easy one, but uh, they're scared of it. Uh, and I think that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why they are having difficulty with it. Uh, a lot of our graduate students uh, are from foreign countries, uh, China, India, Europe, uh, but uh, the Americans uh, seems to be not too much into it, uh, when in fact uh, the mathematical sciences or the STEM uh, fields are actually very beautiful uh, fields in terms of jobs, in terms of knowledge. So so it's it's kind of a tragedy somehow. But uh, I don't know how we could uh, incite or excite them to, to be more interested in take the challenge of uh, learning STEM or mathematical subjects. I think, Edsel, the problem starts with our K-12 education. That's, how, that's yeah. one of those. Yeah. Right. See, because uh, like in the summertime, I teach pre-calculus or college algebra. And then I will have some students who said, who told me, I don't know my times table. I said, you're what? <laughs> you're... So they haven't memorized their multiplication table. So how <laughs> can you? progress. So that's why they're scared of math, because they're scared of fractions. But you can't deal with fractions without your foundational mm -hmm. multiplication table. So I think that's, but we know that we can't go back there. And that's what administrators always say. We have the students that we have right now, we have to meet them where they are. That is true. Yeah, <laughs> we can. Yeah, that's true. What we have in the universities are what we get, but somewhere uh, early on, maybe in the, in the elementary school mm -hmm. or high school, uh, we should do something there so they will get interested and not be scared of math. I think it's the the idea is to increase their their love for solving puzzles, love for solving problems, and uh, in the joy of uh, discovering, I think is what is missing. Or somewhere there, there's a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think the it's now the the generation where they always want hacks, so they always yeah, want the easy, the easy. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's the thing, and I think we have uh, teachers uh, down the line are in some sense at fault also because uh, we try to cater to the students and say let's make things uh, kind of easy. But it's not an easy subject. Uh, you have to go through it to enjoy it. Uh, uh, we, we all know, I mean, I took calculus, it wasn't easy, but, but I love it. I learned a lot from it. Uh, so in any other mathematics class. Uh, so so I think uh, maybe we try to pamper students. We try to make it easy for them. 
when life is not easy. So I, I think something has to change. <laughs> yep, that is true. So, but I learned from you. So I, I tell them what yeah, the standard learn the hard is. way. <laughs> I well, tell them what the standard is, and you provide scaffolding for them to get to your standards, not lower the standards to make yeah. life easy for them. And I still do that. Uh, I'm yeah. teaching a very abstract class this year. Uh, this yeah, this year, and this is actually my joy because uh, when the dean appointed me chair, he said you don't have to teach for this year. I said, I want to teach because uh, that's my only joy. <laughs> I put it at a level and I said to the students, you really have to try to, to do this. We're not, we're not going to make it easy. You have to learn it. And after some time, they, they kind of enjoy the process of learning and solving problems. So I right. think I think not uh, make things uh, easy when they are actually not easy. The, the joy is the, the problem solving, uh, the discovery. Yeah. Yeah, and you, I you look like you have something to say, <laughs> Billy. You're muted, Billy. I think he just wants to smile. Okay, Xenia, do you yeah. have something to say? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think when we have the freshman students at the university, we also have to teach them not just the math, but we have to teach them the study skills. Definitely. A lot of them will say, I didn't have to study in high school. And then they get to their first math class in college and the expectations are now different. I'm not going to remind you that there is a problem set two. If you miss it, then you miss it. And so they, the, the thinking that they have from high school to college, it's really a big leap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it falls on us also to teach them how to study to be a better student. I think it's kind of true for a lot of STEMs because I see the same thing in my advanced biochemistry classes and even the ones who already have an undergraduate degree, they want to do an A in biochemistry, but they have never taken organic chemistry or never taken starting biochemistry. So I'm just like, hang in there, tighten your seatbelt. We're going fast. We need right. to catch up. Yeah. Well, I was reading an article and now the doctor in the audience will <laughs> might <cringe. laughs> Billy. <laughs> so they are saying that they want to take out the chemistry prerequisite for med school. Oh. And I'm thinking, I don't want my doctor not to know any chemistry at all. <laughs> yeah, well, well, here in the... In I the think I need more my chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but I need my math too. And yeah. my calculus. <laughs> according to... Uh, what I'm learning is that, oh, I wish I knew how calculus was used in epidemiological, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. whatever, <laughs> you know, how the how epidemics proceed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that sort of background, what is this for? And I had to find out later on, kailangan pala itong ano, itong calculus neto, madali na lang kung alam mong calculus. And what can I say? That's, eh, I'm going to have to get my money back from UP. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. This is great. Yeah, yeah I, I think my, I, some, I think uh, one idea that I have is uh, for children, uh, even at a very young age, uh, we should teach them uh, uh, solving uh, even uh, simple puzzles. Uh, there's puzzles where the 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 solution is not obvious. Okay, that solution you have to work at it because it's a it's a creative aspect, you know. And uh, and I think that is something that is missing because our students are simply looking for a straightforward algorithm to get to the solution. When in fact the beauty is in that uh, testing possible ways to crack the problem. Like in medicine, it's the same thing. And then the joy of discovering there. But the, for many students, I think that is lost. They, they simply want a straightforward way to get to the answer. When life is not that way, <laughs> science is not that way. You're trying to discover a new drug. <laughs> it's not that way. It's a difficult process. And uh, the same thing in other subjects. Uh, so I don't know what we could all do, but uh, to teach them 
to enjoy the idea of problem solving. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things that uh, we need to do uh, to the younger generation. Otherwise, we will not have uh, creative people anymore. <laughs> yeah. And not to be afraid of failure or of not making be afraid of failure. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually where you learn most. Uh, okay. The best way to learn is when you fail. Because mm -hmm. when you fail, then you say, why did I fail? What were what were the things here? That's the that's the where the and then you learn that and then you, you learn from that. Yeah. I, I think so, we're 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 sometimes particularly I see that a lot in the US also. They want everyone to succeed. They don't even want to give honors because we cannot make people be better than others. And that's not how the real world is, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so in my lab, when I'm doing an experiment, if everything works, I start to get worried because I'm not learning anything new. Why is everything working this way, right? Yeah. So, you know, uh, we need to think that uh, failure really is a lot. You don't want, you, you fail, but then you have to get up you know right. and, and that's right. where you learn a lot uh, in life yeah yeah, yeah. and i yeah. guess march earlier you mentioned about ai we also have to take into account what ai is doing now yeah. for our students because yeah. now yeah. they just want to use it without even thinking they can't even look at a solution generated by ai and see if there is a flaw they'll just copy it and take it at face yeah. value yeah, yeah. that's a uh... That's a further danger these days that uh, it could be so easy for students to simply mm -hmm. ask uh, chat GPT and then uh, it's not they're not going to learn anymore. I, I think yeah. I think we could use AI to help us all learn, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not properly used then. It simply makes makes things worse. So <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, maybe in the future everything will be done by uh, by robots or something yeah, it will be nice. <laughs> but it has yeah, to create the robots right right that's what that's i tell my students yes, yes, yes. do you want to be the one creating the robots uh -huh. then you will be the ones with the money or you want to be the robot <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. i don't know how is it in, in medicine uh, uh is it the same problem in medicine do you do you, do you encounter this uh these retention problems in the in the medical field. Oh, uh, I, are you asking the ex the experience in medicine, uh, yeah. sir? Yeah. Yeah. The... Oh, you know it. It's uh, the same thing is is happened. I was a residency program director, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, you know the result, but. How did we get to the result is the more important thing. And uh, I was thinking about your comment with regards to AI. And I was asking my, my grandchildren, oh, what is one plus one? Okay, they know that. And then mm -hmm. how about one million plus one million? Can you tell me what that is? <laughs> oh, just do that in AI. But then if you know the principle, yeah. if you know the principle of what is one plus one, exactly. and then you just let the computer do the 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 one million over the trillion or how many miles you have to go to Juniper, mm -hmm. uh, the Jupiter Pala. <laughs> that is, mm -hmm. that is, but but sir, like you, like you, Dr. Ed Salpena, I insist on my on my medical student understanding what is behind. Yep. That's the the result and what is behind the AI. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, everything. If you understand what is underlying it, then yeah. everything becomes a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, yeah, so well, even in biochemistry, because students tend to memorize the structures mm -hmm. and it never works. It becomes harder when you memorize the structures, whereas you understand how the reaction is proceeding find the imbalances in electrons, you can make any reaction work. But if you start memorizing uh, figures and structures, it does not work. And I always tell them, no wonder it's hard for you. <laughs> you just have to, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, this has been a lively discussion. I wish our other uh, participants will, this is your chance to speak, you know? <laughs> but anyway, um, so I we're running over time. So I want to thank Xenia again, 
And uh, she actually presented this talk at the APAMS meeting uh, in the Philippines, but it was part of a parallel session. And so not too many people heard it. And so I said, well, you know, we need to have a larger audience. And I guess now there are a lot of people who signed up for it. There's at least 90 people who signed up for this. But I think it's because uh, uh, the Philippines has been <laughs> attacked by another typhoon, Christine. And so probably people lost power and that's why there wasn't... Um, a lot of people, but there may be other people also listening on Facebook. The stream, uh, st we're streaming live on Facebook, but also I know that people go back and listen to these um, recorded sessions, which are all posted on our YouTube channel as well as on our webpage. So we've uh, expanded actually our capacity to store um, a lot of these webinars because people go back to them. And normally, uh, from what I hear, um, it's even though we have a little audience now some people have had like a thousand views on youtube because they go back to see this so thank you xenia for um for this very exciting talk um all of us have encountered difficulties in calculus including me <laughs> i had to depend not on my, me, my i have my es my classmates uh, <laughs> and i remember oh and i do remember going to physical chemistry it was all calculus and guess who was enjoying my physical chemistry it was Edsel. <laughs> So it's like, oh, I have this problem, like I hate that problem. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, so with that, let, let me let me make a comment though, because uh, I think for the young people in the audience, uh, I remember when I was at UPLB, and then I took a minor in economics, uh, and uh, when I was taking economics, uh, it was too easy for me because uh, I was good in calculus and. Uh, a lot of the things in economics is just applying integral or differential calculus. It was so easy for me. All my classmates were having difficulty on that. Uh, so if you know calculus or math, things become easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, let that be a motivation for something. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have people thanking Xenia. So anyway, um, we would like to present this certificate of appreciation. We will also email this to you so you can print it uh, since we cannot see you in person. But the certificate of appreciation is presented to Maria Xenia Agustin, PhD, for being our speaker at the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering webinar entitled Enrichment Sessions in Calculus One, a path to retaining and graduating engineering ma majors held on October 25, 2024. Presented this day, October 25, 2024, with our deepest gratitude and signed by our president, Dr. Gladys Completo, uh, president 2024-25 of the FASE, our Philippine American Association. Okay, uh, Xenia, thanks again. And so I... I uh, would like to take the uh, Feb can we uh, to announce our upcoming seminar. So as I've mentioned, the third part of this series will be presented by Dr. Rigoberto Advincula or Gobet, as we all know him. He is Governor's Chair Professor at the Department of Chemical and Bio Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He is also at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences. Uh, so his uh, um, his uh, talk will be in person at UPLB and hopefully everything will be fine there so that it will be attended in person by everybody. Uh, I hear they have a, a brown out there now, so hopefully the power will be back by Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, when the seminar will be. Uh, it's at 3 p.m. Monday, October 28. Uh, it will be at the PSLHA Institute of Chemistry at UPLB, and it will also be available online and streaming by uh, on Facebook. Um, after that, we have three more seminars for the rest of the year. As we've mentioned, every other um, Friday in the Philippines and every other Thursday evening here in the U.S., uh, we have webinars presented, and so just keep looking. If you, you don't get an announcement, just check on that date. Our next speaker, uh, which will be on November 8 in the Philippines, November 7 here in the U.S., is Dr. Christian Malapit, and uh, he's Ilocano. For those of you who are Ilocano, he is a uh, an assistant professor of chemistry at the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. Uh, he is truly a rising star uh, in, in the field of uh, organic synthesis. 
Uh, he will present a seminar on synthesis and electrochemistry for reaction discovery and energy storage. I know that this is a very technical title, but really I heard him give a talk at the APAMS in Florida, and he is looking for things that have uh, applications in health uh, and drug synthesis and development of drugs, and he's a really nice guy. So uh, uh, if you can check out his web page, just look at it. Uh, just looking at his web page gives you a warm feeling about uh, the happy lab that he's in. Uh, so that is November 8, November 7 here in the U.S. And then the next webinar that uh, will be presented by Dr. Neil Concibido. Uh, he's exactly um, a certified process safety professional, uh, part of global um, synthesis in Japan. Um, and he's going to talk about his Balik scientist journey, promoting process safety management in the Philippine universities. Um, he is actually one of the outstanding alumni of uh, in uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering at UP. Uh, and so his webinar will be on Friday, November 22, and Thursday, November 21 here in the U.S., and uh, in the U.S., please note that it will be 7.30 p.m. instead of 8.30 because uh, we're back to Eastern Standard Time. No more daylight savings time. And then the next web, uh, the last webinar for the year uh, will be presented by uh, Dr. Aristotle or Aris Obando from UP LaSalle. Uh, he is the Assistant Dean for Research and Advanced Studies and full professor and research fellow of the Gokong Wei College of Engineering, De La Salle University. He is the founding head of thermochemical analysis or TALA uh, from the De La, uh, at De La Salle in Laguna. And he will talk to us about an application of fuzzy set theory on the sustainable production of microalgal biofuels. So this is a very interesting uh, alternative source of energy. So the webinar will be on December 6, 8.30 a.m. in the Philippines, December 5, 7.30 p.m. here in the United States, Eastern Standard Time. And then after that, we're gonna have like the closing ceremonies of the year for Paase. Uh, we'll have some kind of um, uh, a holiday event. Uh, it will be announced by our president that day. Uh, it will be on December 13th here in the U.S. and December 14th, I think, in uh, 14 in in uh, in the Philippines. Um, and that is my birthday, so please come. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, thank you very much, everyone, again for attending this very uh, interesting and uh, exciting webinar by Xenia. And I hope that you take the messages home to your classrooms and to your universities. And so um, we'll see you next time, okay? And Marcus, I know you are there. Next year, we'll get you. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone, and good night. Or good morning, pala sa Pilipinas. <laughs> and I hope you're all fine. Sana hindi kayo binaha. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Fab. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Zinia. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Hey, Marcos, nagpakita ka. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.